Praise the Lord. We are back again to continue with our studies today. And I've been uh, sharing on the Passover as we are coming into the end of the a Feast of Unleavened Bread time. Uh, I want to share a little few more things today about these, these spring feasts. Um, so I want to start today with my, my title is Discerning the Time. And my first question would be, when did you first recognize that Christ was real and the redeeming Savior of your life? Or when you first recognized him, how did you first recognize Well, I was, uh, I was going through some hard times, and I felt like there was a burden on me that nobody could take off. I felt like nobody could ever forgive me for what I've done. And so uh, one day I heard about him, and I just seen what he had done, and it just came out of me. And I, I, felt, I felt who he was and what he'd done, and I, and I just, you know, got all balled up. But that's when I realized that Christ was a deliverer and savior of the people. And that so you, you personally experience what he had done for you yeah well he like vanquished what my feelings were for his okay he removed yeah, these things I felt his pain rather than mine like he just absorbed it for me at that at that time okay so all right who else um when did you first recognize that christ was real or the, the real redeeming savior of your life i was actually about Three months ago, I was sitting there and, you know, I came to the men's home two months before. I was determined not to go to Christianity. I was actually pretty much against it all the way. Two months later, I was sitting there and it dawned on me. I've been fighting and running from him for about 20 years. And I finally realized um, there was no point in doing that. And I just gave in because I just didn't want to. You know, I realized that without him, I wasn't anything. Okay. All right. Who else? Um, I think this uh, a few years before I went to the home in California that uh, I was that I would I tried a couple of times to take my life and it never happened. And uh, that's when I re I mean I had already heard about God. They had introduced me to God and everything. But that's when I really realized that, uh, you know, he gave his life for me and it wasn't up to me to die or anything. But, you know, it was whenever when it was his will. And I knew from that time on that sooner or later, because there was people already praying for me. People praying for me and I knew that there was no running from him. Okay. Anybody else? I think for me it was about two years ago whenever I broke down and... Uh, just realized in my heart that I was running from him um, and I prayed so I prayed to Christ and asked him to save me from the situation that I was in and deliver me from everything that I was going through and just crying out to him and it, it was more along the lines of like a day or so that he really took hold of the situation that I was in and just started restoring my life from there. Okay. Anybody else think of uh, um, when you first recognized that Christ was real or that he was the savior of your life? I know for me, um, kind of the same thing. Wasn't sure what to do or anything, but knew that I needed some type of help and um, I heard sermon after sermon in the men's home and uh, just one day God touched me and brought an understanding to my life came to the knowledge of the truth and 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 I knew that 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 Jesus Christ had lived and died and resurrected for me 
and that I was desperately in need of a savior to make it through everyday life because my life wasn't going nowhere without him. And, uh, and so, I mean, I, I, I seen, I seen Jesus and he pulled everything out of me. And it was like when I first seen and, and repented and, and asked for forgiveness that, that something came upon me. And then I realized that, that Jesus was a very, very real God that really did the things that the Word of God says for me. And I understood that this is the Savior. This is what every person needs in life. It's, it's not one person greater than another. It's that we all need Jesus. And, and, and when we first encounter that, that understanding, recognize that understanding, it's like it's, it's something that you've never understood or seen before. Let's look at uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 21 through 30. This is uh, when Jesus was uh, a young, young baby. Luke chapter 2, verse 21 through 30. says, And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child. His name was called Jesus. The name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the faces of all the people, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and glory of your people Israel. Let's we'll stop right there. Scripture talks about this. It talks about Jesus as a baby. And then it talks about this, this man. It doesn't say much about this man, but if you, you study and you look, Simeon, he was a priest. Okay. My, my first question would be, is, uh, or my next question is, how did Simeon know that, that this little baby Jesus was the <coughs> Savior? As you look, he says, for my eyes have seen your salvation. How? The Holy Spirit told him. Okay. The Holy Spirit told him. What else? How did he know? We, we, we talked about how we recognize Christ, how Christ came into our lives, how, how Christ showed us, brought uh, he, he, he came and he showed us himself. Right now we're waiting for a second coming of Jesus, right? And 
I said at the beginning of the teaching, the title of the teaching is Discerning the Times. Okay, so you look, no one told him that this was the Savior, right? He just knew that it was Jesus. No one can tell someone that this is the Savior. Okay, it's just like Peter. Remember what Peter says? Christ asked, who do they say that I am? And, uh, and Peter says, you're the Messiah. And uh, the Lord says, no one could have revealed that to you except for my Father in heaven. Right? But how did he know that this young little baby, remember that they're waiting for a king to come and rule and reign. They're not waiting for an infant savior. They're not waiting for a, 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 a savior to come from, from here nor there. They're waiting for him to redeem Israel. They're waiting for him to redeem Jerusalem. They were suffering under siege and bondage during this time. And, and even more so, with the religious compromising to Rome during this time, conforming. And you look, how did he know that it was the Lord? And one was, and, it, and, and it, 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 more so than any, is that the Holy Spirit told him. But what else? I mean, could it be that um, since he was a priest, he must have read the scriptures that the some of the prophets left or something that would describe certain things about Jesus or okay let's we're, we're, what else do you think how could he have known hmm. let's think back remember we were talking about the Passover Okay, we've been talking about the Passover for quite some time. Did it, how, how, how long did it take before God showed up in Egypt? Was it 2,000 years? Or more? Hmm. <laughs> how long were they uh, uh, in captivity in, in Egypt? 40 years. Huh? 40 years. 400 years, 400 plus years, okay, the exact amount of time is, is unknown, but it's around 400 plus years, okay, uh, so they were at this place for 400 plus years before hearing anything from God, right, same with Jerusalem during this time. During this time in Israel, people were aware of the signs of the time. Just like right now, we are aware of the signs of the time, right? We see things happening right now more so than ever before. I mean, you look back and, and people in their in their 70s, 60s, 50s, 40s, so on and so forth, I can even go as far as to say in, in like 90, 80, you know what I mean? They've ne you've never seen a pandemic like this happen. You've never seen, I mean, there's earthquakes, happen, there are tornadoes just happening in Georgia during all this time when everybody's supposed to be quarantined. I mean, all kinds of stuff is going on. I mean, there's earthquakes close to Roswell. doesn't matter if they're 4.7 or an 8. They're happening. Things are happening. And so, and you look in Scripture, and we've been talking a lot in our, in our Friday night Bible studies about revelations, and it's the signs of the time. Okay? And, and more so, you look, and it's the time of God's feast days, right? Right now is Passover. For the first time ever since 
the very first Passover, the people had to do the Passover supper inside of their homes. Since the very first Passover, everyone since then, they've gathered together as an assembly. They have went to Jerusalem. They've done all the other things. They haven't just done it inside their homes. Amen. For the very first time again, in almost 2,000 years, or way more than 2,000 years, they, they've been doing this. Uh, they did this again. I mean, this is the signs of the times. So you look here, and Israel was in captivity for 400 plus years. And there was silence before that. But they were waiting. For God to deliver their people. They understood that the time had come, was coming, right? Same with this. In the scripture that we're reading, Simeon understood the signs of the time. He understood that, that God was com coming, the Savior was coming. Remember, God had told him that he would not die until, until he seen the Savior. He was awaiting. He says, now I can have rest. Now, Lord, let, it says, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. Which shows you that he was an elderly man ready to go away, right? Shows you that, that but the Lord had said that you will, not, you will not pass until you see the Savior come. So he was waiting. He understood the signs and the times. Same with it, it, in Egypt back then, there was silence, slavery, no God. They were crying out, suffering, going through things, and, and no movement of God. The same with here. There was a still silence, but, but they could see and discern by the times. Remember, Scripture says that there will be a peace on the earth before the Lord comes. To rule and reign a second time. So he, he understood these things. They were living in anticipation of a coming Messiah. That's the thing, is they were living in anticipation. You had your hand up. I apologize. The word consolation, is that the signs that you're talking about? That's what it means or what? Uh Waiting for the consolation of Israel. Yeah. So I don't know the exact definition. We would have to look it up. But that's what it means is that he was waiting in anticipation for the Messiah. Did you have something? Actually, I was going to say there is a second part of that. His spirit told him because he asked God, you know, and God told me that, you know, regardless of until I see the Messiah, that. I can't go in peace. I ain't going to die until I see him. His spirit told him because he waited that long. And so he, he sort of had discernment about it. Right. Okay. So we must be aware of God's time. Okay. This is the whole thing is, is we see these things happening right now. And we must be aware of these things. Okay. Um. When the Holy Spirit revealed to him, it's actually called divine revelation. And that's what it means. When, when, when God told you that he was the Lord, when, when, he, when you experienced that he was the Savior inside your life, you had divine revelation of a Savior. Okay, you had divine revelation of a God who was very real and who had died for your sins. So divine revelation actually means the revealing or disclosing of some form of truth or knowledge or making known or informing us of a, a creator or a higher deity. In this case, it is God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Okay, that's who it is. So this is what he, he had divine revelation that this is the Messiah. 
Okay, this is how we know that the Father revealed to him that this was the Messiah, just like Peter was revealed that this was the Messiah, he was he also was revealed that this was the Messiah. He was awaiting in an anticipation, understanding the times, understanding what was going on. And when he's seen, it's like when you see Jesus, when we first encounter Christ for the first time, it's life changing. Right? You can never I mean, it's like we're chasing that high from, from now on, right? In everything that we do, we're trying to press forward and draw nearer and nearer to God because the very first time that you experience Christ, it's, there's nothing like it. I mean, I could preach all day long and, and share all day long on, on my very first experience with Jesus. Whether I could say this specific date or not, I know what he did. And I'll never, ever forget that. Because it was so life-changing for me. There's nothing else in life that can, can compare to what God did. That, that deliverance, that, that, that where you don't need the things which you once did or had or whatever anymore. It's like, I'm filled. I am fulfilled to the fullest inside. It's like that I had a God-shaped hole inside my heart. And, and Christ is, it has just filled every single part that has never been filled before. Right? That's what he does for us. He opens our eyes. And see, he opened his eyes. He's seen. It's like when you see, like John the Baptist, he says, Behold the Lamb of God, one who takes away the sins of the world. He knew right away, right? He says, I'm not worthy to, to even, I should, I should be the one washing your feet. I'm not. I should be the one that is baptized by you. Simeon had supernatural insight, right? You look here and his scripture says that he was a Holy Spirit filled man. In that time, there wasn't many Holy Spirit filled men. But he was devout and he was just. You can learn something from that because he, he devoted himself. And, and just means that he lived an upright life. That he, he lived a, a, a righteous life before God. So much so that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Led by the Spirit, filled with the Spirit. Holy Spirit brought revelation and it had been revealed by to him by the Holy Spirit. Right? So God was speaking to this man. Supernatural insight. How do you acquire supernatural insight? Prayer. Prayer. Deep intercession, right? Prayer. Seeking out the heart of God. Fasting. Fasting. Reading God's word. Meditating. Studying the scriptures. Receiving instruction from the man of God, our pastor. Okay, receiving instruction. Always doing what's right. Doing what's right. Living right before God. Spiritual insight is something that we all need and that we should all desire. Wisdom that comes from God. When this man, Simeon, filled with the Holy Spirit, led by the Spirit, seeing this baby Jesus for the first time, he knew at that very moment that this was the Savior of the world. 
right? He says, now I can go in peace. I can depart in peace. Your servant can depart in peace. He says, I know that, 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 that God is here to bring, bring salvation to this land. That's what he says. And he even brings out a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. Right? This is for a whole world. Not just a one people, but a whole world. He understood that, that, that this is what Christ had came to do. When people thought that Christ was only coming for a, a one people, the Israelites, he knew that this, this, this Savior was going to save the whole world. There's a, in Israel, there's, there's something called a Pinyon Haban ceremony. It's P-I-D-Y-O-N-H-A-B-E-N. And it's a ceremony. And this ceremony, the Pidyan Yaban, it means redemption of the firstborn son. Okay? If you look back, the scripture says that it says, and behold, It says in verse uh, 27, So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God. You look here, according to the Mosaic law, each firstborn male is to be presented before the priest at one month of age. So the scripture says that after his circumcision, his name was called Jesus. Then after the woman, after her days of purification, because after she has a baby, she is considered unclean. But after these days of purification according to the law of Moses were complete, the mother was to bring the child to the priest, to present the child to the priest. Okay? And when the child was presented to the priest, the priest would actually present the child or dedicate the child to the Lord. Okay, so he would give the child to the Lord. Every firstborn male, they had to do this with. At one month of age, all right? Remember this ceremony, this is what the ceremony was. The Pidyon Haban, it was redemption of the firstborn son. So he was giving the child to the Lord presenting him to the Lord, but the child could be redeemed at this ceremony paying five shekels. Okay, so the child could be bought back paying five shekels, or paid for with five shekels. So this is what he was doing. The reason I say this is because the offering of the firstborn male son, the redemption of the firstborn son, or this offering presented by the priest with the young firstborn male child, is a representation of the Feast of the First Fruits. Okay, the Feast of First Fruits is offered every spring season following the winter harvest, which is planted. So they planted certain 
things during this winter season, like we sow in during the winter seasons, that we may reap a harvest when springtime comes. Okay, they sowed in, main thing that they sowed in was barley. Okay, and they, they, they planted the barley, and then it was, so this is a representation of the Feast of First Fruits. You remember the, the Cup of Redemption that we talked about? The Cup of Redemption, God said to his people in Egypt, I will redeem you from Egyptian bondage, right? I will pay for or buy back or buy you back out of slavery, right? Same thing here when the, the mother or the father is redeeming this child during the first, during this redemption of the firstborn or this ceremony. So remember I said, God said to his people in Egypt, I will redeem you from Egyptian bondage. What way did God redeem his people from Egypt? How did he redeem his people? Huh? Okay. Think about it. We've been talking about Passover. We've been talking about the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. How did God redeem his people? How did he buy them back? Even you look at, you even look at in the garden with, with Adam and Eve. Sacrifice. Sacrifice there a lamb for every household. Okay. Using blood, the, blood. the blood, right? That's how he redeemed his people was through the blood covenant contract, right? Okay. Same thing in at, with Adam and Eve, same thing, right? He he killed an animal and he wrapped them in their their Skin, right? He killed the animal, and he killed this animal instead of killing them. Right? He uses the blood to redeem his people. So he told the people that they were to find and take an unblemished lamb of one year, kill, and place this blood upon the doorpost of their home. Right? Look at this. Remember, we're, we started to talk about the redemption of the firstborn son and how it correlates or represents offering to God your son as a feast of first fruits or your first fruits because this is your firstborn child. Remember? And it says, in this, it talks about. In uh, e um, in uh, Exodus, it talks about that it's a male of one year, right? Unblemished and clean. The same thing here, what does God do for us? He gives his first fruits to us, right? That's what he did, right? He gave his first fruits. To us, it all goes hand in hand when you think about the first fruits, and we'll get into uh, uh, the days of the first fruits and 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 when they're supposed to be and stuff like that in just a minute. But it has to do with the feast of the first fruits. God gave him he himself, or he presented. His only begotten Son, the Lamb of God, for us, that He would be offered up for the sins 
of men. Right? So he gave his only begotten son. Remember? It talks about it in John 3.16. For he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Right? So he gave his only begotten son, his only son. His son of... So, so, so what she did was she bought back, she redeemed. She bought back her son for us. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So it was all... God gave it, and then God gave it back, or gave him back. So, Feast of the First Fruits is a, a spring feast. Okay, you got Passover, Unleavened Bread, and Feast of the First Fruits during the spring seasons. There's seven feasts total. And you have, what is it, Passover, Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits. <coughs> then you have Pentecost. Then you have Feast of Trumpets. Then you have what, the Day of Atonement. And you have Tabernacles. <coughs> All seven of them. <coughs> but these are the spring feasts. And... It's designed that through the people's offering to God, that God would honor and bless the rest of their offering for the following months up to the harvest season. So you give your first fruits to God, right? You give your first fruits of that harvest to God, and God would bless <coughs> the remainder up until the harvest season. Okay. So, the Feast of First Fruits also is a way of marking or counting the, and I don't know if I say this word right, it's Omer, O-M-E-R, <coughs> and the word actually means sheaf or measure. The sheaf was, they, they would wrap up a barley sheaf of their best, of the best first fruits that they could find. Okay, they would, they would cut it with the sickle and they would wrap it up and they would wave it before the Lord, right? And because the barley sheaf is the first crop that appears ripe in this season. This is the first one that appears out of all of all the things that they plant in the harvest. Okay, so the first fruits is actually a time marker. What it's a time marker for is it's the beginning of the counting towards the Feast of Weeks. That's what it is. Feast of Weeks is also known as Pentecost. Okay? And Pentecost, what does Pentecost mean? It's uh, the Holy Spirit, right? What does Pentecost mean? 50. 50 days. Exactly. Pentecost means 50 days, right? So, if, if the Feast of First Fruits is the time marker to begin the count of Pentecost, it starts, you, you start on the day of the Feast of First Fruits, and you count 50 days from there. And you'll have Pentecost. When is Shavuot? Shavuot. Sh Ain't that the Feast of Weeks? Shavuot. Yes. Shavuot. Yes. Shavuot. Yes. Hmm. That's what it is in Hebrew. Shavuot. Shavuot. Oh. Shavuot. Okay. So, 
If you look in the scripture, we'll look at it. I want you to go to Leviticus 23, verse, and we'll start at verse 9. But if you look in the scripture, where it gets a little crazy, is that it does not specify the date when the Feast of First Fruits is to be. It, there's not a specified date. You can look all over and you won't find a specified date. Like it says for uh, Passover, right? There's a specified date, right? When is, when is Passover? 14th day of the fourth month. 14th day of the first month. Oh, first Aviv, month. or now it's Nisan, or it's April in ours, right? But it's the 14th day, and in April it would be a completely different day, but... This month, it was the 14th day of Nisan or Abib was on the 8th of April. Okay, but, and then it says the next day after that day starts the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, right? And you have seven days beginning with <laughs> the 15th for Unleavened Bread, right? And so they're so close knit together that they they consider it the eight days of Passover. All right, but we know that the what what we do know about the uh, feast of the first fruit, though we don't know the specified day, it's celebrated um, during the spring feasts, and that it's connected to the spring rains in Israel. So let's look. Leviticus 23, verse, and we'll start at verse 9, and we'll read about the Feast of the First Fruits. And it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of first fruits of your harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest will shall wave it. And you shall offer on that day when you wave the sheaf a male lamb of first year without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall be two tenths of an eaf of fine flour mixture with oil and offering made by fire to the Lord for a sweet aroma. And its drink offering shall be of wine and of one-fourth of a hen. And you shall either eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your God. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. So it doesn't say a specific date. We know that Passover and unleavened bread, they go together. One's on the 14th and one's on the 15th, right? In verse 5 of 23, it says, On the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. Verse 6 says, And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat the unleavened bread. So you got the one and then the seven is eight, but it doesn't say a specific day for first fruits. I know we're trying to figure out a little bit about the time, but I was just wondering like when uh, Cain and Abel, when they were asked to bring their first fruits, does that have any relation to do with the thumbprint maybe of, good. of the time maybe? It could. You would have to do some homework, looking back and, and see when the, when, and you can look in history and find out, but yeah, we can look and see that it does. 
does have to do with some specific things about the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. And I'll get into that. Okay. So, Josephus, uh, the first century Jewish historian, he actually writes, remember we said we don't know the date, the actual date when the first fruits are, but he says, this is only what he says, it's not in, in the Bible, you, can't, you won't find the date, but you can find dates when they have celebrated it. And, and why they celebrated it, and they honor to the Lord, so they, they, they call this the day. And actually, this year, it, it was on April 12th. It was actually, and, and we'll get into that. Look, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But look, so Josephus writes that it's on the second day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which would be the 16th day of a beef or... 16th day of Nisan. So you think about it. You got the 14th, right? 15th and 16th, right? Check this out. And then, so the first fruits were presented. The days change from year to year. If you look on a calendar, even a Jewish calendar, if you look back 10 years, if you look back 10 forward, It'll be on a different day every year. Okay, our, uh, and, and, the, and so the, they didn't celebrate the Feast of First Fruits on the 16th day of, of Nisan this year. That's why I say it changes every year. Even though he wrote this, this is, this is not what God said. So he, he, he didn't, they didn't do it on the 16th day. But in Christ's time, it's clear that they could have done it on the 16th day. And I'm going to tell you why. The reason I say this is because Christ's fulfillment of these feasts. Okay, we know that Christ fulfilled Passover. We know that Christ fulfilled unleavened bread. And Christ also fulfilled feasts of first fruits. Okay, so what were some of the fulfillments of these feasts? Let's go with Passover, unleavened bread, and if you can think of any of your first fruits, be my guest. Passover would be the death of Christ. Why? Mm, because the blood of Christ. Uh, covers our sins. Okay, so he was the Passover lamb okay. offered for the sins of the world. Right. The, okay, so there's the fulfillment of Passover. Be redeemed. That's right. Blood on the doorpost. Right. Unleavened bread was a time to um, clean out, clean house, clean um, sin. Sin. So Christ okay. being sin, a sinless man. Mm -hmm. Okay. The crucifixion would be the unleavened bread. Wouldn't it? Nope. So, so check this out. Think about it for a second. Christ was placed. Okay, so remember, we'll go back to unleavened bread. Let's, let's do the Passover. So the Passover, Christ was our Passover lamb fulfilling Passover, right? Then we got unleavened bread. So he was our, our unleavened bread, right? Given for us. Also, remember we talked about the, the, the matzahs, the three matzahs? Okay, this is during unleavened bread also. And what, what was done was they wrapped it in linen, right? And they put it away until the end, right? And then they pulled it back out. Same with Christ is they wrapped him in linen, put him in a tomb, and brought him back out, right? Same thing. You look at first fruits. Remember if I said, if, if the Bible says that, that Passover is on the 14th, 
The Bible also says that unleavened bread starts on the 15th. The Jewish historian Josephus says that in the month of the 16th day of Nisan is first fruits. Right? But I thought you have uh, seven days, or was it seven or 14, from unleavened bread to. To the Feast of First Fruits? Right. That's that that's not how it landed this year. That's I don't think that's how it landed last year. That's not uh how it landed according to what Josephus says. And I'm just saying what he says. We don't know the exact date, but we do know this this is a fact, and I'll I'll show you uh scripture to back it up. Is that though we don't know the exact date of Feast of First Fruits, and it varies from year to year to year, and it, all we do know about it is that it, it is it, it's the marking or counting of up until Pentecost. Pentecost doesn't have a specific date neither. It's just the you count from first fruits, the very first day of first fruits, 50 days later, it's just like that this year also. I counted it myself. I think it's like May 31st. If you count it from, from first fruits being on the 12th of April this year, you'll go to May 31st. You can look it up. It says that the, the Feast of Pentecost is on that day. Okay. The reason I say all this is because what was the 12th of this month? No, that was just a couple of days ago. The fourth day of Passover? It was the resurrection day. Oh, Sunday. Right? It was the resurrection day. Think about the barley. Oh. It was first shown and brought out and presented to God, right? And offered to God on the Feast of First Fruits. So Which means he resurrected, he rose up right from the ground, he rose up from the dead, and presented himself before man and before God once again. So he is the fulfillment of first fruits. Hmm. So look, Christ was God's only son. He was his first fruit resurrected three days later. You count 14, 15, 16. That's why you can say, you can look up, that it could, and, and, and you just have to do your study, and we'll probably never know the exact date, but we know that Christ was crucified on this night, or taken on this night, right? And so, whatever day that he did resurrect, he is the first fruit. Okay, this year, it was actually on the Feast of First Fruits, the Resurrection Day. And, and, and it changes. You can look it up later. It's, it, it's from every, every year is different, but this year you'll look and it'll, it'll show you that it was like, what, five days after the beginning of Passover? What is that? 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, four days after Passover, Right? So, at birth, he was dedicated to God, and at his resurrection, he was also dedicated to God in the new life, his resurrecting life, right? Look at Romans chapter 6. Verse uh, 5 through 8. He says, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, and that we should no longer be slaves to sin. 
For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And then it says, and then we'll stop right there. And then look at 1 Corinthians 15, and it'll talk about the first fruit, Christ being the first fruit. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. So it says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Which means he is the first one to resurrect and bring life to us. Through his resurrection. He is the first fruits of God. Right? You understand? He is the first one resurrected. And then it talks about in Romans 6. That we all who partake in Christ. Have been resurrected with him. So we are the next and the next and the next and the next. But he is the first fruit offering of God. Therefore fulfilling the Feast of First Fruits. So as we as a people are to sanctify ourselves before God in Christ, in doing so, we are setting ourselves apart. Therefore, presenting ourselves to God as a first fruit offering or presentation to God, a dedication that is holy and clean before God. I want to encourage y'all to, to take a look on your own time or whatever and, and look up the dates when first fruits are this year. Maybe look it up with how Christ is the first fruits, all these things, because he has fulfilled these spring feasts. He has fulfilled the Passover. He has fulfilled unleavened bread. And he has also fulfilled the Feast of First Fruits. Okay. I just want to encourage everybody today. Um, like, share, subscribe. And um, be blessed.